civiltà dell'amore. Fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. Thank you. Today we will talk or we will reflect on the pandemic and what mass vaccination has been. Today our guests are General Francesco Paolo Figliolo, former extraordinary commissioner for the COVID-19 emergency. Dr. Giovanni Rezza, Director General of Health Prevention at the Ministry of Health. Dr. Guido Bertolazzo, coordinator of the vaccination campaign of the, Lombar of the Lombardy region, and still coordinator of the Lombardy region. And finally, Giancarlo Cesana. Who I think you know quite well. Professor of General Applied Medicine at the University of Milan Bicocca. What is COVID? Well, first, before we give the floor to our guests, I would like to just summarize a couple of statistics to, t to help us realize what COVID has been. The ISS has issued a report which summarized what the situation has been up to the 24th of July. 170,000 dead, 139 million vaccinations, inoculations. The people who have received second and third doses are about 96 million. These statistics show how tragic this virus has been why it's, it, we just don't have it anymore and why people have stopped manifesting its terrible symptoms. So a question for General Figliolo. The vaccination program involved millions of Italians and hundreds of millions of jobs. How was it possible to govern an organizational effort at that scale? We had problems with the supply of drugs. For example, there was controversy regarding the alleged priority given to other states. And did logistics, storage, st supply chains work as well as, as, it could as it could have? Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Of course, this is the most important question. Let's start from the beginning. As soon as I was nominated, it was something I didn't expect. I was quite taken aback. I was contacted just a few days before, and I thank uh, Minister, uh, I thank Draghi for giving me this 
great responsibility. As soon as I arrived, we tried with a team that had just been made up, composed. Uh, we tried to look at all the logistics and we tried to look at other experts in uh, financial experts, in organization. And we tried to look at specialists to help us compound and improve our knowledge to enhance production. And there was a lot of administrative work to carry out as well. Of course, we had a very good structure with a vertical a verticality, which was very well managed. The the control was the this was governed in a decentralized way. And thanks to Prime Minister Draghi and all the central bodies of the various regions with the vaccine campaign, we tried to fix an objective, which was to vaccinate 80% of the population. Mm, at the beginning, they were over 60s, over 60 with Moderna. And I fixed the objective to get to September with the 80% of all these vaccines done. And then things changed. The objective was actually reached 10 days afterwards. But if we're talking about such huge numbers, as you said, we can absolutely forgive ourselves for this small delay. And more vaccines were uh, made available, but some were then blocked in March, and they could only be given to over 60, uh, the over 60s in our population. And some of the problems you have already pointed out, the centers, uh, the vaccination centers, needed to have enough storage space, and we managed to institute 3,000 different, 3 million different centers. And I called this, in this attempt, which was an ethical vaccination, going out to meet people to vaccinate instead of the, for going out to vaccinate those who couldn't come to the center. And of course, then we had the issue of supply and distribution. And this needed to also be um, confronted with the actual need and demand. We were constantly checking the demand. And we tried to distribute as many as possible, 146 million doses we managed to distribute. We have a strategic center which is managed by the uh, Department of Justice and Defense. And this efficiency uh, was made possible because of the lessons that we learned along the way. We have a capacity, uh, a system in place which is helping the country. At the beginning, when I had just arrived, we had four million doses of vaccines available. We tried in every way to increase, to make up for all for lost time. This capacity for production I like to talk about this example. The more we got warmed up, we were slow, slow to start, but once we got warmed up, everything started to go smoothly. At the beginning, we had a couple of problems at the beginning, but 
all of this, all of these lessons we learned at the beginning then were an added value along the way then on the journey. We were able, once we had the two vaccines, on a technical point of view and also on a political point of view, thanks to van der Leyen, we had we were able to actually have an excess. Um, we built up a stock pile of vaccines in advance, and this enabled us then to have about 500,000 vaccines a day. And then we tried to have um, Europe negotiated as a whole with uh, big pharmaceutical companies and showed for the first time a cohesion, a unity to give everybody the full quotas, the full quota and full number of vaccines available uh, needed for that country based on population. After the summer of 2021, in a couple of countries in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe, there was a low uptake in the vaccination um, campaign. And we had just asked actually uh, an anticipation um, to the U EU Commission that they give us more vaccines. But at that moment, we were actually doing quite well. So this, we were doing very well. So we were at full swing and the example of when we say that Italy works as part of a team wins, we found that many people like in a, a hall such as this one really decided to engage and uh, become in private entities to give a hand. Banks all of the world of production businesses. And I even remember Cardinal Bassetti who called me and he said, General, when I had just been named General, the uh, Episcopal Community Conference wants to help and uh, give their availability to help in the vaccination campaign in the parishes. This, all of this was made possible and the, all of this happened because we came together. Uh, we used logistics, experience, the world of volunteering and working dialogue with the regions. The powers of general, I actually use them quite little. The first time was to use all our resources to uh, as best we possibly could and then defined define um, as you said to decide who should receive what as president draghi said this morning the weakest and the most elderly in our society need help that need help the most the weakest in society. We thought of the world of those who are invisible. We called it the project with the community of Sant'Egidio. We tried through information systems to help um, homeless people as well and give them a code so that they could have a right to the vaccine because they, would, they wouldn't they would have a social security number and give them access then to this. So this was the added value that we were able to um, experience and we screened the population across the board, um, even to those who didn't have access to doctors in 10 years and all of this benefited the population enormously.
Thank you, General. Dr. Retza, mass vaccination responds to the need to cope with a deadly emergency such as COVID. What was the decisive moment? The arrival of the vaccines, the determination of the state, as General Figliolo just explained, the involvement of specialists? Well, Let's remember the beginning of this pandemic. The end of 2019, the beginning of 2020. I worked in the public health uh, department and someone had asked me that January of 2020, when will the vaccines come in? Well, vac vaccines against uh, human coronavirus we didn't have. It's very hard. Basically, it's a, it's a so sort of flu, but we had no vaccine. We didn't know if we would effectively would be able to produce a vaccine with, that was effective and safe to cure coronavirus, to prevent coronavirus. Well, okay, let's say probably in a year, we'll probably, best case scenario, we'll have to wait a year. So, but then the 27th of December of 2020, you all remember, the first vaccine started to come in. In the first phase, The supply, the the demand, there were few vaccines. The demand was very high and the supply was quite low. But all of this was a triumph of virology. In less than a couple of months, I don't want to be a rhetorician here, but these vaccines were created also on an innovative platform and they were effective, as we all know. That's the first point. The second point is that at the beginning, there is a sort of a honeymoon be between the vaccine and the, and the population. At the beginning, we tried to vaccine everybody and our population, especially in Italy, we suffered quite a lot in the north in, the, in March 2020. And the fear we suffered as well. It felt like we were on a sort of a honeymoon phase, a grace period once the vaccines came in. Everybody wanted to go and get vaccined. Then vaccines become a sort of a victim of their own success. Either they make the illness uh, disappear, and which is good, we shouldn't complain about that, but people then aren't afraid anymore, or the uh, smaller, the impact is smaller. But it gives us the impression that we don't need them anymore. And we do need them because the, we still need them because the amount of people uh, in hospitals is still overstretched. Even mm, the issue of natural immunity is still a possibility, but our hospitals and sanitary institutions are still uh, stressed, under stress. I've always worked in the public health sector, but when profit works in favor of human development, profit wins. Innovation, technology of various pharmaceutical companies, we have seen 
how they were, uh, all of this was excellent. Their work was truly exceptional. We have done very much. We have achieved a lot. I'm trying to compliment my uh, colleague here, General Filiolo, and his determination with which he undertook and carried out this campaign of the health ministry and the government. All of their efforts were truly exceptional. But I was also talking here with Bertolazzo about this. The regions really gave a great contribution in all this. As far as, as much as it was decentralized, all of this, uh, the regions really uh, showed how important, played a very important role. At the end of the day, the system worked out very well on a three, uh, from a 360 degree point of view, all around. Perhaps there had also been um, an extra effort also push that came from the Army and the Department of Defense, and this helped a lot. And here, uh, the another thing, since we might talk about uh, anti-vaxxers, of course they exist. They can perhaps create turmoil, but apart from uh, I've never been attacked by anyone for my, and nobody has attacked me in a in a confrontal way, we could say, or has confronted me directly. It is a question of very small minority of people. We saw that when the situation was very serious and critical, people showed, manifested, that they wanted to get vaccined. Most people want vaccines and see the need. We don't want to make it an ideological question. Of course, the Green Pass was useful when it was um, happening, when it was put into place, and despite the Delta and Omicron variant. It's a right more than a duty. Well, people said, if we vaccinate 70% of the population, then we ha will have reached herd immunity. Um, and above a certain percentage of vaccination coverage, the virus will not circulate anymore. But this does not depend on this, but it depends on how contagious the virus is. So one to three infection ratio at the beginning, of course, and this increased over time. Vaccinating 70% of, vac of the population, we had new variants and then immunity, which then faded with time. So there are many different factors involved. Um, we could say that the law whereby one vaccinates oneself just to protect others actually becomes more of a right to protect oneself rather than a responsibility towards others. One of the last specialists, there is not a great culture of, uh, there are specialists of vaccinations and GPs and pediatricians gave their contribution. And it seems that specialists seem to sort of put themselves, they kept to one side. And they are useful, of course, and especially when we have to go and reach 
people that refer to these specialists because of perhaps personal issues, their, their own specific health uh, questions. And therefore, it is very important that the vaccinology culture improve, that our outlook on vaccines become um, more widespread and more positive. within the medical community on a, as a whole. Thank you, Professor Etza. You posed the question of this kind of middle-class health establishment. You know, you, the entire health uh, est uh, healthcare establishment st uh, was hit by this. Dr. Bertolazzo, uh, mass vaccination was a a question of centralization and that that has a an important impact on the uh, the region to to centrals to federal government uh, relationship and the regions have always been had a good degree of autonomy so practically speaking did this uh, mass vaccination program cause a a problem with the management of daily vaccination activities in the regions or were the problems more on a, a local level rather than a national level? First of all, good afternoon, everyone. Let's take a step back and let's not only talk about mass vaccinations. The the main problem we had, which was uh, was was evident from the first day, and that we all had to face, was well, when we started this dramatic emergency. the the main uh, The main issue was that the relationship between the state and the regions. And this started from a, a, a mistake, a kind of, uh, a, bit, a lot of confusion because on the 31st of January, 2020, the then government declared the state of emergency nationwide. At that time we were talking about, we were calling it the uh, coronavirus. COVID-19 hadn't really been defined as a term yet, so we still called it coronavirus. When the uh, the government declared an, uh, a state of emergency, all these uh, aspects that were relative to the uh, how good the, the points about how good the uh, the local structures were, rather than the national structures, these arguments vanished. If you think about in February of 2020, after the state of emergency, a, a commission to manage the emergency was summoned, and they were in charge of uh, national civil protection. And it was given almost absolute power to coordinate and decide what measures the government should put in place. Uh, this is what the uh, the ordinance of the of January said to uh, to protect and control and, if possible, eliminate uh, the emergency caused by uh, COVID. And we all know how well that went. There was months of discussion on the problem of. Who needs to do what? The regions obviously didn't hadn't been told uh, orders from the given in clear orders from the national government. They tried to organise themselves independently in the first stage of the pandemic, in those first dramatic months. Beyond what was those uh, the the lockdown uh, that was started even late according to the uh, suggestions of the epidemiologists uh, it was eventually kind of abandoned the uh, and in favor of uh, initiatives that were done on a widespread fashion to try and fight this epidemic you know we remember that the government over the course of march 2020 decided to uh, form another commissioner but another commission but which didn't uh, didn't supersede the last commission, but uh, simply added itself onto the side. And uh, that was with the, the predecessor of General Filuolo. And thus we went on for months in the kind of an indeterminate, vague uh, uh, vagueness of what both national and regional measures should be. It was There was a lot of confusion. I had the privilege in those months, in those very difficult, sad months, to work in four different regions in our country because in March 2020 I was in Africa at the time managing uh, the the 
final effects of the Ebola crisis. I was summoned by the, the president of Lombardia, the Lombardy region, to create that famous hospital uh, in, in the Milan Fiera, which was then it was called the, the, the Bertolazzo Hospital, ironically. And it allowed us in a, a few weeks to create a, uh, an emergency trauma shelter and uh, intensive care unit to, with, with gener to generate a lot more uh, bed space with ventilators. So I then got COVID uh, not long after, and so I, I spent a few weeks in uh, in intensive care, and so I became both a, a user as a as a, rather than uh, as well as an operator of this uh, of the Lombardy health system. The hospital was then opened, and we'll talk about later as what happened uh, afterwards. After we made the hospital in Lombardy, I went to the Marche region where I was asked to, uh, to, to build a similar but smaller hospital in, in the Marche. And this was March 2020, or May 2020. We used a similar structure to what we'd done in, uh, in Milan to build an intensive care center with 89 beds. In the summer of 2020, right, uh, right at the beginning of the summer, when it seemed like COVID was, was over, you know, it's true that some people even wrote books saying how I defeated the virus. And at that point, I was called to Sicily because the the famous uh, Immuni app, which uh, you all remember, it didn't work. The contact tracing app, it was basically pointless. And Sicily rightly wanted to, in the in the summer period, to make something work. The only time when they could have a an, eco an economic bounce back from the, the, the COVID tragedy, tragedy. And so together with the, the presidency of the region, we made this new app, Sicilia Sicura, which made sure that whoever came to Sicily would register themselves, could go on holiday, but if they were sick, they could become identified, contact traced and uh, treated and if necessary, isolated. In the second wave, the one that shouldn't have happened and instead, you know, happened anyway and as we'll remember, made an even bigger number of, left an even number bigger of victims than the first one. I went to the Umbria region to try and set up a, another initiative to, to face up, to face this um, second wave, to open m new centers, get more uh, th intensive therapy beds, because the vaccine w still wasn't really there. And so that was the only thing we could do to, 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 to lock everyone down where necessary and make the healthcare system as efficient as possible. However, in October, November, December 2020, the, the, the many intensive care places, the beds that were meant to be added on to the ones that already existed in March, were, hadn't been completed yet. And so the uh, hospital in the, in the Milan Fiera and uh, the hospital in the Marche, they, was, they, they, they were faced with uh, they helped almost uh, 1,500 people recover in these uh, intensive care shelters. The 31st of January, I was recalled to uh, Fontana and Morati, asked me to help them once again in Lombardy. 31st of January, General Filiuolo said when I was uh, nominated, I, I then com began my activities. Um, Correct me if I, uh, if I'm wrong. You, the first of March, you were nominated. 2021, that is. First, he told us that the vaccine campaign started the 26th of December, of 2020. What happened in January and February of 2021, before uh, Com Commissioner Figliuolo came on came to the scene? First, we were given some indications that we need to vaccinate the most vulnerable, especially the over 80s, and then doctors and nurses. These were the, were the indications we were given. But then there were some more or less risky, uh, at-risk categories, which we called the the one beast, which we didn't know. It was, it was completely uh, impossible to understand who was meant to be vaccinated and who wasn't. And there weren't clear indications on the, the procedure, the organization, what criteria va vaccine should be done by. Uh, we, we're talking about mass vaccination. This is, a, it's, it's one initiative that uh, was adopted over, over uh, 
the February 2021 in Lombardy, Carro and I worked together to create a, uh, a strategy for mass vaccination, which hadn't been indicated by what was the, uh, the, the commission at the time that was responsible for doing this work, actually. So it was up to us to create this massive campaign. They were trying to set something up, some uh, government employees who had absolutely no idea what they were doing, neither in the field of logistics, nor in the field of organization, nor in the field of, uh, of, of logistics and of planning. We'd been put into the hands of people who'd been chosen, who knows how or why, to organize the, the greatest uh, threat this country has faced since the Second World War. I remember February very well. It was a nightmare. The, 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 the nights uh, I, that I didn't sleep, that we spelt, we spent desperately trying to understand when will the vaccines come? Because we were told they'll come the day after tomorrow, we'll have 500,000 doses from Pfizer. And we, we would organize ourselves, and then five hours before they, those, the, 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 the 48 hours elapsed, they were told us, oh, uh, DHL has cancelled the flight, so the vaccines won't arrive. It was all based on a, a, a total improvisation, and then and then Lombardy had its own problems, and we'll talk about that later. But then a new government came about, and Francesco Figliuolo came, uh, an army man, a, a, a general of the, uh, the army logistics unit, a, a normal guy, but with, well, with a plan, with a criteria in place. I'd never heard him talk about vaccines, and, but we wouldn't really have needed them because the emergency campaign was, was based on a single, uh, a single criteria called organization. And this is what General Filiuolo did. He organized. And so he said, I, I followed uh, prudently, cautiously, and the, the regions did their jobs. But on mon the Monday morning of every week, from the 15th of March then, the, uh, and on, he'd, he'd email all of us and he'd give us our jobs. I, I'd call them, it was like, I was, it's, it's like he was giving us our homework. Every region uh, would receive, obviously through the, uh, uh, official, the official army post, every region would receive its, uh, its, we its goal of the week. And on that basis, so he so that he'd be able to know how many vaccines would enter Italy over the coming weeks, and he he made a simple calculation. He he didn't give the regions free reign to decide what they needed to do. He was in charge. He was the boss here. There was a chain of command and control, and it was understood and followed. He was the uh, the apex, and he said, Lombardy, Monday, fifteenth of March must make get us vaccinate 75,000 people in Lazio 45,000 people every now and again I, I'd laugh because I thought because he used to say Basilicata 3,555 vaccines and I thought well wh why this 55 that's very specific he was an extremely precise man it was a, it was a very military precision he he he, he, he instituted You should you should think uh, get to grips with a certain concept that our politicians still haven't understood, and uh, for, for ten and they insulted me for ten years when I was the, uh, the 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 head of civil protection. When there's an emergency, and I think this emergency was uh, gigantic in scale, democracy must survive through these crises, but it must it must survive in in a, in a in a structure thanks to a, a certain person at the top who gives it a, a sense of responsibility, who, who, dis who makes the hard decisions, who says, uh, who decides, okay, what has the government done? Here's how we must act as fast as possible. This is the kind of first commandment of crisis management. From 
March 2021, we 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 we, 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 we moved on to a new. It was a new story. It was a totally different situation. We suddenly gained clarity. Everyone knew what they had to do. We had uh, an input. He con he he controlled us. He he'd get on our case if we weren't uh, meeting our quota. The, the, the quota that he gave us that we meant to do over the course of a month, a day, a week. We, we, we might have given him some help as the Lombardy region because we always try to exceed our goals and never uh, go lower. We always try to show that, that the target of 500,000, 600,000, what he'd be indicating as daily targets, We'd, we'd, we made sure that over uh, as, as a whole, Italy would always meet these targets. This was the, the story of the mass vaccination campaign. And when he came on the 31st of March, the first uh, representative of the institutions to come from Rome to Lombardy f for already in a good few months, he, he came and was able to see that mass vaccination, that these large centers had been set up and had been organized according to his directives. So there was a, a centralization of, uh, of orders coming down and of directives being told, uh, a transversality on the regional level in how to act in a, in, a, in a timely manner what were the commissioner's orders. And as such, the Italian mass vaccination campaign was one of the best in the world, full stop. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Bertonaso. Professor Cesana, we've been talking about uh, anti-vaxxers and the like. Um, let's try and understand what's the relationship between personal freedom and the need to protect everyone's health. So the story of medicine as we know it is quite long, it's 2,500 years long in fact. The problem of limiting personal freedom for health reasons is a very, very old one, tied to the, the need to, to that there are certain illnesses that we don't know how to cure. COVID started like this, uh, a type of influenza that had a, a mortality rate uh, 20 times higher than normal influenza which was, uh, and, and we were not uh, capable of dealing with it initially. In the beginning, this, the system was quite simple. If you were ill, you were distanced from everyone. It, it's a bit like what you hear in the Bible about the um, about lepers. They were cast out. This was kind of the most primitive form of, uh, of COVID management. And then over the, the, the sick people weren't cured they were uh, it, the, the, to, be, to deal with them was difficult and you know for, for centuries there haven't been hospitals hospitals were born alongside christianity in the fourth fifth century a.d out of a, a hope for resurrection you know death is no longer the final word on life and this is how they uh, on life this is how they could kind of begin to cure people from a psychological side and so it it was the, the curing of, of terminally ill people, it was a, a kind of palliative care. Public health uh, systems began, began to uh, equip themselves better, even until the, in the Middle Ages, and, and Italy uh, created uh, health officials and health offices that, uh, that began to ha try and cure uh, public ignorance on, on topics of healthcare. And these are the systems that we saw at the beginning of COVID as well. Isolation, quarantine. The first quarantine was codified in a Reggio Emilia uh, in the year 374. The prohibiting of public gatherings, even religious ones, closing uh, public settings and, and so on. Things evolved and at the beginning of uh, 1800, uh, a, 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 a doctor from Göttinger, uh, Josef Peter Frank, uh, who was living in uh, Austrian Venice, invented a kind of medical police. The role of this medical police was to, uh, to, to find those who violated health norms. 
and from then things changed drastically. The, the legislative system began to protect society even through a drastic intervention. And from that point of view, healthcare became a, a, a public concern and then the, a, the welfare state as we know it only uh, really manifested itself after the Second World War, but that's where we started. And even in Italy, there were some significant movements, for example, in Milan, the, uh, the, the, the Doctors for the Poor movement was created to try and help people, and th they'd eventually go and cr found their own private hospitals for maternity protection, um, like the Gaetano Pini Center, the, and, and Paolo Pini as far as uh, psychiatric, for, for psychiatrics. And here we, it, we began to decide to, to understand that uh, healthcare could be a tool to uh, improve uh, public well-being. Until the Guido Bacelli, who was the, uh, the, the founder of the um, Umberto I clinic, said that the, the, the strength of the people is healthcare. And struck by the, uh, the evolution of healthcare, uh, an American pastor uh, a certain Rochambach in 1907 said, and then he, he got the idea that, that science was, was what would save society. He said, the speed of evolution documents the uh, immense capacity, uh, the immense latent capacity in, uh, of, of human nature. Maybe in these, uh, in these 19th centuries of uh, human influence, remember he was a, he was a Protestant pastor, have been a long preliminary period of growth, and now we're coming to the end, that the fruit of that work is, is almost within our reach. As you know, what happened after that, there were two world wars, Nazism, the Holocaust, communism, and, and, and things went on from there. And, you know, science hasn't saved society yet. There's, there's, a, there's an important aspect for which uh, healthcare helps, and I'd like to underline it, and that's if freedom is doing whatever you want, as it's often defined, the problem is, well, what do you want? Because if you want something that's wrong, and if you, you follow this, you, you, you get worse. Either we get worse or society gets worse, and we need to learn this, it's extremely important. Thank you, Professor Cesana, as always. Very interesting following what you what you say. Our, our time is coming uh, is coming to a close. I'll try and uh, summarize. Back to General Figliuolo. The the, the 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 structure of the of the commission that you that you had to deal with. Uh, you had to. To hand to handle the handle the positions, the various uh, con often contradictory opinions of specialists of epidemiologists, um, and uh, the the line adopted about the green pass, it it it, it was shown to be a, a winning decision, but it can also be seen as a kind of moral moral persuasion as far as the citizens are concerned that if you know if you vaccinate yourself you can go here you're authorized to go there but if you don't vaccinate you have to stay at home what's your position on the how do you where do you stand on the on the green pass and on these other uh, topics let's start with uh, how how to understand how to follow who to follow when people are contradictory when I was made commissioner, I already had a kind of a level of experience because uh, the health of the army was on my shoulders, and let's say about two thirds of the of the or even three quarters of the the army's healthcare I already looked after. So I already had a certain level of experience I'd organised um, based on what Guido was telling us. I'd, I'd organised 350 uh, beds, 150 in intensive care, and. It, almost all of them in COVID hospitals, and, and our uh, Chilio, for those who don't know, is is the military clinic in Rome. Our army doctors always had a an an approach towards uh, infectious diseases, even those that you know in the West we thought were eradicated, because by 
it, it, by going on missions in the the, the furthest uh, parts of the world in South, in South Saharan and Northern Africa, in 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 the on the Horn of Africa in in or in the the Near East, there was there's always a need to do a kind of initial tri triage before uh, introducing the wider public to this structure. So our, our doctors initially were, were extremely busy, especially in, in the Bergamasca. I already had as, as kind of my, uh, my consultant, Dr. Battistini, the, the, the army uh, consultant for health who, who came with me to help. I had Professor Guido Gassi with me, who, gave, who directed me on what was happening uh, and what the, the European pharmaceutical regulator was doing. And when I was when approached by on all these sides as commission and to try and work out uh, when we, we set up the, the there was you know the the, the Italian uh, pharmaceutical agency had its own commission and Arginas and the ISS the uh, National Health Agency and there was the 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 wider health care agency and there was the prevention agency you know I got a headache from all these different bodies and commissions and people who had to report to me. So that, that we, we, we had an aim, we had to vaccinate in as, as, as quickly as possible the largest number of people as, as humanly possible by immediately going to vaccinate the, the, the ill, the immunocompromised, the elderly, the weakest, and then finally everyone else. Without no ifs, no buts. When people would write, we are, we are from this association, we are that association, I'd write them, thank you. Uh, for, for everything you're saying, please follow my orders from the 9th of April that uh, defines, that was like what Guido told us, that defines what you need to do. And then when these people would say, oh, we need to buy these drugs, they save lives. All right, you know, I was an executive, but I, I, was, I was smart enough. I'd talk to my staff and I'd ask around. I'd talk to the, uh, the, my, the functionaries already helped me and I'd try and find a middle ground. Then uh, Gianni Rizza knows, I've always said that... Uh, the, uh, after a certain point, you always have to make a decision. I, I, I stood up. I'd, I, I'd, I'd listen to uh, to the scientific advice, uh, and shame on me if it wasn't. But you can't always follow everyone. At a certain point, you have to have the uh, the courage to choose. You make some decisions, and you take responsibility for them. You, you, you do it with awareness, and following. Then I think there's always been a, a, a discussion. We, we'd have weekly dis, uh, weekly meetings. Uh, with with the health industry, there's there was a lot of because uh, first of all everything we talked about was streamed, and this was a problem not because we shouldn't be transparent, but because we need to to, to give our citizens uh, some some simple effective explanations because. Not everyone has, 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 has had scientific or medical studies. People get lost. They say, okay, well, what do I need to do? And so and I think at a certain point, a certain point you need to be a, a point of reference and you need to be aware of this. I, I've always felt this responsibility, just as I've, I've always felt the, um, the trust of the president. And this gave me even more energy to, uh, to, to kind of deepen everything. I've got to say, I often heard, and I... Uh, I quote it every now and again, and I'd like you think about all the, the notable people, think about Professor Muzzi, who uh, he'd bring me briefings, he'd bring me evidence, he'd bring me scientific journals, especially international journals. And so from the onset, I was kept well informed. And from like, the, for example, the New England Journal, I was able to understand what this virus was doing. And we also need to make uh, remediatory measures. We need to understand what are our neighbors doing. And this is what we did uh, very often together with the, uh, the Ministry for Health. As far as the Green Pass is concerned, it's a decision the government took autonomously, I can say, as a, as a citizen, that I think up to a certain point, if the, gov if the government imposes a rule for public health, it, it has to be followed through. And it has to be followed, actually, by the people. And I think... The government followed through in its choice that was owed probably to, uh, to, to the need to give, uh, to give a sense of certainty and safety to people. It was also a kind of a premeditary issue, then it had its own problems, but um, even if I, 
I think the Italian people had understood that we, we, we were fighting for our survival. And so the fact of, with my mandate, having received over 48 and a half million uh, completed vaccine cycles, basically 48, 48 million is, means about 90% of uh, the over 12s because uh, there are 54 million, uh, there are 54 million over 12 year olds in this country. So we, we got most of them. If you think that there's a certain number of people who, who can't be vaccinated for health reasons, and there's about about 300 to 500,000, and you can correct me if I'm wrong there. Well, what are we talking about here? I think most Italian citizens understood more than everyone else what we needed to do. And maybe th th there was a lot of debates going on that, that couldn't have not, um, you know, there was a lot of discussions that could have been avoided. We could have spent that time working rather than arguing. As you've been able to hear, uh, General Filuolo shows what he, he really is. It's, it's nothing new for those who know him. Professor Rezza, uh, you, we heard earlier from, from General Filuolo that comparison with, uh, with the European uh, health, uh, healthcare bodies and all these kind of more or less stimulated, involved uh, healthcare bodies in the problem of vaccination. The, even the regions, what, 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 what problems did we have? And beyond this, um, was there something more we could have done in communication between our institutions? Maybe trying to, uh, to, to, to keep the, their emphasis on the, the steps forward we needed to take. Or the, uh, over the, especially in a time when it seemed like everyone had their own opinion of what the solution was. Well, unfortunately, because uh, out of modesty, I decided not to candidate myself and put myself up for election. Uh, all jokes aside, I understand General Figliolo very, very well. When we, we get confused amongst all the thousands of different acronyms. We must be very careful to not get them wrong because based on the grammatical gender of the acronym, we might be thinking of two different organizations. So on an Italian level and on a European level, we have to somehow come to an agreement. I have to say that at the beginning of the pandemic, I was quite negatively impacted by Europe's reaction, by Europe's response. If you remember what the Albanian, the Cuban, and we didn't really understand the Russian doctors' responses, they all came. But there was not uh, one single and unified EU response. And many of us thought at that point, where is Europe at such a critical time? And I think that this absence of a, an answer, of a reply, response, a uh, homogenous response, was quite grave, it was very significant. I also think that society now has been completely um, turned upside down. We have a steering board which was set up, which had all uh, representatives of the member states of the EU. And as Francesco Figliola remembers, uh, we talked about the type of vaccines, the quantity, and we were in full agreement on the fact that the vaccines would have been distributed based on the single population of each member state and that no state member state would have been penalized therefore and this favored the arrival of numerous vaccines in copious numbers 
and if that weren't hadn't been the case, we probably would have taken the blame for not having organized the campaign properly because if we had bought too much, we would have been accused of causing a shortage, and if we'd bought too few, we would have been also accused. In terms of preparation for this pandemic, out of prudence, we tried to prevent issues. So then from this point on, Europe's response was quite good. Then the single associations and acronyms which we were talking about that are present on our national territory. There is the uh, Higher Sanitary Council, the IFA and the ISS, and they s many others that are completely independent bodies. And perhaps they have not been totally transparent in their being independent. But they are credible from a scientific point of view, and they maintained a very certain a certain level of autonomy. And this perhaps crop compromised their position with the Ministry of Health. And sometimes we decided together and we try to help each other it was it is important that when we take important decisions for our country it is necessary that we not do this by ourselves and that we're not alone in this my last point is for the anti-vaxxers the FDA and was very uh, quick to act. Somebody asked a question in one of the interviews before this conference. Well, we have used experimental vaccines. No, we haven't used experimental vaccines. We skipped some of the uh, phases of experimentation of these vaccines. No, absolutely not. We have not. And the uh, American and English Association, the FDA, they decided to take great responsibility in these brave decisions to show evidence and proof to authorize vaccines that were not experimental and to approve vaccines as emergency vaccines. And from an emergency use of the vaccines, then we pass to a, a standardized uh, distribution of the vaccines. And so these entities, the FDA and the e EMA and Rimbalzo Life, they gave us a hand in approving uh, accelerated process processes of approval and authorization of vaccines. So we passed from, um, we, we managed to do what we normally do in, fifth, in five years within very, a very short space of time from a point of view of risks and benefits, well, the scale tipped in favor of the numerous benefits that we were able to enjoy. I'll just say one thing on communication. There can be an institutionalized communication which can be very decisive. which maybe is not as flashy and appealing, but it is just as important. 
I was a spectator on both sides. In the first, in the first part of this journey, I was in the health, the public health sector, and then I was in the private health sector. And then going on to the public health sector, in a certain sense, I was a little bit more protected, but also a bit more disadvantaged because your voice perhaps is less present. And if perhaps then you are very, um, you appear quite often, then the risk uh, of being labeled as ideological is higher. But of course, the position of being part of an institution and institutional communication is always risky. I think that in terms of of self-criticism, communication, but then Guido will talk about this anyway. I announced that Guido Bertolazzo will say all of this. As in terms of what can be improved from an institutional point of view, that we can never get to a situation we, without um, doing with without compromising institutional communication when there are people who are most evident are the ones the ones who are most um, who show up the most are the ones that are uh, interrogated and asked for the information. Well, this the aspect that perhaps leaves us a little bit per perplexed is that it is this lack of visibility of the expert, which is perhaps what we need mo the most. Thank you, Dr. Rezza. But to do Dr. Bertolazzo, I'll ask a question that will also in have to do his personal experience. You received very heavy criticism, fierce criticism uh, in the very first phase of max vaccination. And also the presumed inefficacy of facing COVID. Uh, were the detractors right? What was the winning model? Well, I will be brief. On the communication aspect, as Reza said, he was very diplomatic. The communication officially did not exist initially, and when it began to exist, it only damaged everything. We can't think of a commissioner I beg you, put on a mask, and another commissioner that was that said, "I'm not putting on a mask. Do whatever you like." From a constitutional point of view, we had to give every evening the number of deceased people, and maybe I would have preferred that this what hadn't happened. But rules that uh, a communication that would prevent. Uh, people from do, from saying the first thing that came into their head. We have people that spoke in people in name of all of the institutions and all of the state and in, of the whole state and parliament. We didn't have one single person who did this. And the other mantra, other than the rapidity of the vaccinations, was to never leave anybody alone. Six years ago in Am Amatrice and all the area around there, uh, 10,000 were left behind. And they still need to fi fix and resolve the problems that were caused. This is not an emergency. This is a serious state. Like it was a serious state response, not like the one that happened at the beginning of the pandemic. 
Lombardy was abandoned, was the region that was abandoned left alone. I'm not sure if in a deliberate or an involuntary way. I saw it with my own eyes. I went to the hospitals of Lombardy before I got COVID because I went to all the intensive care units and all the nurses and the mask that Giovanni Rizza said before, they were in the intensive care units because the individual protection mechanisms were not were non-existent at the time. Nurses and doctors died because they went around with precisely that kind of mask. And this happened because in the region that inevitably being the most populous and biggest crossroads between the uh, airports and I'm an, I'm an Italian person, I'm not a factious person, but I have to say that Lombardy was really brought to its needs, knees. And this role that Europe had been playing, and thankfully, thanks to their help with the vaccinations, they earned, they came back to help us. But the Russian doctors, they sent military medic doctors from Russia, Albanian and Chinese doctors. And where were those Spanish, English, German doctors? Why didn't they come and help our country? Why didn't they come to Lombardy? Why, why didn't, instead of doing contracts with other Italian regions, the doctors of Italian regions, and for two or three months, they were closed, those doctors, within their departments. They couldn't even go home because if they went home, they would infect their loved ones and their relatives. They were by themselves cooped up with the patients and nobody went there to help them. And that's why Lombardy got to the end of 2020 completely exhausted a healthcare system which was f exceptional for 11 months had been completely left by itself and I saw the hospital of Crema on the 17th of March of 2020 60, 77 elderly people of my age all of them sitting on a chair in agony do you know why? Because they didn't have oxygen. In Lombardy, there was no ventilators. In the 17th of March, 2020, they didn't have oxygen. The most basic, the most easy resource to obtain. And they didn't have that. People died because they didn't have oxygen, not because they didn't have beds. There were episodes, situations that ha that happened, were kept happening for months and left Lombardy on its knees. A region that had been exhausted had problems then to start getting organized. Let's not forget that we're talking about January and February of 2021. So before and the 1st of February, I was in Milan and I said, okay, let's go and get vaccinated. There were 800,000 people getting vaccined and a lot of them were also uh, home-based. They couldn't go to the hospital. So we said, how can we let 800,000 of these how can they book their vaccination? What method, what system are we going to put into place to respond to their need of getting vaccined? Let's call in ARIA, Agency for Regional Development. It was ARIA FRITA, which means Friday or absolutely, absolute rubbish. 
on the 7th of February that this was not going to go well at all, from, a, from the, the bookings were not going to work out, we decided to call the Italian post system. And we began a platform to start a booking system for vaccines. So the solution happened thanks to the Italian post system on the 7th of February. And in the Milan Fiera, we organized a big meeting with 50 uh, directors from the healthcare system to organize the vaccinations through the Italian post system. And after three days, they mysteriously, the Italian post system vanishes mysteriously. And during the whole of the month of February, after hours on the phone during the night to try and talk to Aria, 300 of old people from Bergamo go and get vaccinated in other places. Varese people were sent then, hundreds of them, hundreds of miles to another place. So we realized all of this at midnight and during the night we we called, we spent hours on the phone trying to get them to be vaccinated close by in their local area. There was a tiredness, a moral exhaustion, a psychological exhaustion in all the structures. They were on their knees after a year because nobody had given them a hand. And then, then we have March, General Figliolo came and the Italian post system comes back and suddenly, for some reason, the Italian post system starts to cooperate again. And from the end of March to the beginning of April, we were able to vaccinate 70,000, 80,000, up to 140,000 a day in Lombardy. And then when Francesca, Francesco Vignola would ask me, can we manage to do 125,000 tomorrow? Can we, and let's uh, um, be more virtuous than the other countries. And I said, absolutely, we can do this. And this healthcare assistance, we must guarantee this in a modern country like our own. The merits of all this were the nurses, were, uh, were all the nurses, the doctors, the whole system of volunteer work. It was the whole system of Italy as a team. And when we work as a team in Italy, we can, we beat every, no one can beat us. We're coming to the end now. Maybe even, uh, well, we might even run over a little bit, but final questions, Professor Cesana. So all these uh, virologists, hygienists, specialists, COVID uh, experts who uh, made themselves heard, did they help uh, inform people or, or not? So on specifics, they've already, uh, the others have already told us on the issue of communication and organization. I'll, I'll just briefly say something. Giovanni Berlingueri, a researcher, uh, was di uh, died a few years ago. He made an inquest from uh, from which he understood that if all the 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 alarms of all the uh, the alarms that the medical societies had raised, every Italian would have two and a half illnesses, something which is, is clearly not true. Why? Because everyone tends to, to try and sell their message. Even epidemiologists, hygienists and specialists, they try and sell the, their own services. And especially now today, we're in a world where, thanks to social media, extremes are, are inflated. You know, 
sometimes even minor personal defects that are completely blown out of proportion. And from this point of view, I remember Trusani said, we all have our own small defect. And I understood this pr seeing the, the, the King's speech on the, 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 the f on King George, the, the father of the current Queen Elizabeth of, of England, who's, uh, he was a stammerer and, you know, stammering is a, is, is a defect. He, but if you have to declare war on uh, Germany, suddenly this small defect becomes a major one. And we need to become aware of this and correct these small defects, which can become disastrous to victory. So like Bertolazzo just told us, like, like, like they've all said, and these who have been the, the protagonists of the, of the story, if with all the, the clamor that, uh, that the specialists made without a kind of make it with all the recommendations we heard, we have, we currently have 85% of the population vaccinated according to the, uh, to our official health bodies in about a year and a half, we've had about 8 million cases, 500,000 hospitalizations and 150,000 deaths, which isn't too bad. All even if you know the some statistics are a bit skewed. We, we, we owe this kind of relative success to these people here. I thank you all. Thank you for the, the attention and for, your, your, for coming here. I want to take the chance to remind you that the meeting has become a, a, a special foundation which you can now, if you donate, you can write it off in your taxes and now it's worth making a donation to the meeting so that these great initiatives it undertakes can carry on. Thank you. Good evening. civiltà dell'amore, fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo.